Leading Ideas Talks podcast is brought to you by the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Subscribe free to our weekly e-newsletter, Leading Ideas, at churchleadership.com slash leading ideas. Leading Ideas Talks is also brought to you by the Taking Church to the Community Video Toolkit. Explore strategies your congregation can use to reach beyond its walls with worship, community events, ministries, and service. Learn more and watch introductory videos at churchleadership.com slash shop. And remember to stay up to date with the latest church leadership strategies and information. Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos. How can your church reorient its posture toward its neighbors and neighborhood? Minnesota pastor Travis Norvell decided to conduct his ministry by bike, on foot, and on public transportation. He shares how this revealed new people, new partners, and new possibilities for ministry. I'm Ann Michael. I'm a senior consultant with Lewis Center for Church Leadership, and I'm also co-editor of Leading Ideas e-newsletter, and I'm pleased to be the host for this episode of Leading Ideas Talks. Um, my guest today is Travis Norville, who's pastor of Judson Memorial Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he's also the author of Church on the Move, a practical guide for ministry in the community. Uh, this is a very novel, very personal, and I think very provocative vision of, of how churches can reorient their posture uh, toward their neighborhood and discover how God is at work there. And so I'm just so excited to have the opportunity to talk with you about it, Travis. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm glad, glad to be here. And thanks for being on uh, Leading Ideas. I, it's just like a, uh, uh, you know, kind of like an all-star. I feel like I've, I mean, I've listened to this podcast so much. So yeah, this is great. Thank you. <laughs> well, great. So um, in the opening of the book, you share uh, an incident that happened in 2013 that was kind of a turning point for how you experienced your neighbors in your neighborhood because you decided to give up your car. And so I wondered if you could share a bit of that story with our listeners, just so they kind of understand that starting point. Yeah. Yeah, I had always wanted to uh, try to give up a car, but I haven't really, I didn't have the courage or sometimes the imagination to do so. And so I preached what I thought was a really good social gospel sermon. And I asked the question, you know, as the congregation, what are you willing to sacrifice so that others may experience joy? And then that night when I was putting my then 11 year old daughter, Seneca, to bed, uh, she just said, hey, dad, um, what are you willing to, to sacrifice so that others may experience joy? And, um, you know, I, I just felt, I just, I felt ashen, you know, my, my mouth just felt ashen. I felt like a complete phony that here I was all talk and no action. And my daughter was calling me out on it. I mean, she was just giving me a, a very innocent, uh, you know, what you would hope for people actually pay attention to your sermon and ask you questions about it. So I said, I don't know, but I tell you what, I'll, I'll know in the morning. So I turned my uh, living room, my dining room, sorry, into a kind of a midlife crisis center. And I had my laptop and notebooks and pins everywhere. And I just came up with this idea is, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sell the van or um, we're going to sell the car. We're going to keep the van and I'm going to try to bike, walk and take public transit for my job as a pastor. So that's how it started. Uh, and it was a pretty scary venture. Uh, the kids were, when I told them that in the morning, you know, that was, we were going to do this, they were horrified. I, I, <laughs> and I said, look, this is, this is my experiment, not yours. And they took a deep breath and like, okay, dad, we'll, we'll be there mm -hmm. for you then. So that's how it got started. And how has it changed the trajectory of your ministry? You know, it changed everything. You know, it changed everything. You know, um, you know, I went to Colgate Rochester and, you know, social gospel was part of my, uh, you know, the blood that we, well, you know, it was just everything. Um, but I realized, you know, I talk a lot about social justice, but I, I wasn't really spending much time with the poor uh, at all. Uh, so when I started biking and walking and taking public transit, I just found myself with people that I had not been um, surrounding myself with people I'd talked about, but not people that I was in community with. And so that just changed everything about how do we look at the, how do we look at transit? How do we look at housing? How do we look at the economics and jobs? All those things just kind of came to light. Uh, and then it also kind of changed the trajectory of, you know, the, the church had always thought of itself as a destination church. Uh, but my trips on a bike and walking and taking public transit showed me that we were really a much closer church than, um, than that. It, it was probably, think of it, about 75% of the church was really within five to three miles of the 
of the church. Um, and it was really only the 25% that were the people that were driving in from out of places. So it, it reor- reoriented us to really think more about our neighborhood. And we realized that we have no idea who our neighbors are anymore. Um, mm-hmm. That was, that was a, probably the biggest reorientations. Yeah. Yeah. I, I moved downtown about 10 years ago and I, I now walk around neighborhoods that I just drove by in the past and I notice so much more when I'm on foot. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I think how, how just, you know, uh, being, being out and taking a slower pace just changes how you see things and what you notice and all. Uh, so let's talk parking lots. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, I was around for the church growth movement in the 90s, and the assumption was that a church couldn't grow without ample convenient parking. And so churches were buying up uh, adjacent lots in order to expand their parking lots, and mega churches were, you know, paving acres and acres of parking and, you know, had to have parking attendants and shuttles to get people to the building. And um, you have a really different way of thinking about uh, parking lots. Uh, and in fact, uh, your chapter on parking lots, I think, is, is, has been so um, attention getting that it was the cover story for Christian Century a couple, yeah, a couple yeah. of uh, months ago. I was so delighted to see that. Um, but so what are some of the blessings and curses of a parking lot? Well, a parking lot allows you to uh, have, really become a de-neighborhood church. And by that, I mean, it allows people to drive in from miles around and to come to church and worship there and then get in your car and go back home. Now, that, that can be a blessing because there are some places and there are some people in communities that maybe on Sunday morning, that's the only time they feel safe. That's the only time they feel surrounded by people that support them. That's the only time that they feel kind of really um, blessed as a human being with the community and the songs and the prayers. And, and that's very important. We should never um, hold that against them, right? That we need those kind of places. People need those kind of places. But I, I, my thought is that if you have a parking lot in most city neighborhood churches in America, that means that someone's house was taken uh, so that you could park your car there. And my thought is, okay, if you're going to do that, then you need to have as much um, respect for that place and to use it as much as you can to kind of honor that uh, that it was a former dwelling place for someone else. So I think you got to reimagine what you could do with a parking lot because you're only using it for at most six hours a week. Uh, and the rest of the rest of the week, it is it remains empty. So what are the things that you can do with a parking lot that you're not doing right now, other than the temporary storage of an automobile? Um, you know, here in Minnesota, there's a guy that started straw bale gardening. And you can take just straw bales and put them in a parking lot and you can feed, you can two parking spots can produce enough vegetables and produce to feed a, fa- a family of four for a year. Um, you can uh, think about basketball. I, mean, I grew up, uh, there was a story I tell in the book about a, a Methodist church, sorry, uh, some of you that are listeners, um, a Methodist church in my hometown that put up nine foot uh, basketball poles. And it was the greatest event in the world for us because all of us could finally dunk the basketball. There were 150 kids on Saturday and Sunday mornings waiting to play. And the church uh, saw us as a nuisance. And so one day they came out with a blowtorch and a grinder and cut the poles mm-hmm. down. And I think, okay, look, you had a, you had a makeshift a uh, youth group that people would would die for right there uh, in your in your parking lot. Um, labyrinths, um, you know, blood mobiles. Uh, you know, during COVID, we we found out we could use our parking lot for worship. We could do movie nights. We could have bands come out and play. Um, there's just countless things you can do. Bike courses. You know, you can help help people figure out how to ride a bike on a church parking lot. Um, you know, if you go if you look at the Dutch in the 1940s when they were really starting to take thinking about biking, it was church um, basements were uh, bike schools. So why can't we do it in our parking lots today? Uh, There's so many other things we can do than just a parking lot. And I like to think of it more as a church plaza than a church parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well thank you for that. Um, yeah. it's, it's just such an interesting, you know, I think churches are really rethinking about uh, all aspects of how they use their space and their mm-hmm. physical property. And, and I think the attention that you're giving to parking lots is, is long overdue. Uh, but biking and parking are really just part of a larger vision, I think, for how churches can relate differently to their surroundings. And um, you write about how a church's building is an asset for a church to make itself more present uh, to the community. And so I wondered if you could describe some of the ways that your church has done this. Yeah. 
And again, think of the parking lot as a, as a way to start thinking about the inside of your building. So we like to try to think, okay, does the outside of our building communicate our inside values? And then how do we use, what do we do on the inside? Uh, again, just looking at floor space and how many times is it used? Uh, again, we don't have that much, uh, even though we have a, a preschool, even though we have Meals on Wheels at our house at the church, there are counselors and there are um, uh, uh, groups from the community that come in and use it. There's still lots of time when there's not people using it. So right now we have a, we have a, a beautiful baby uh, Grand Steinway piano, you know, that remains unused most of the week. Uh, but now we have a jazz musician who comes in and just practices uh, throughout the week. And so we get a twofer. So he gets to practice. We get to hear great music during the week. But then also on most Sundays, if I need uh, him to play, I'll just say, hey, can you come and play on, you know, Christmas? Mm -hmm. I want, we're going to do a Christmas pageant. Can you play the Peanuts Christmas song? Well, you know, he comes and plays the Peanuts Christmas song. <laughs> um, all these kind of arrangements. Um, you know, I even think like the church library um, is a great place to start with. Like let people use it. Uh, come in and where else are they going to find a, a kind of a rich variety of theological books uh, right on the shelf that don't have to request or wait in line for? Um, there's just so many things about the church building that we could be using more, um, just like let's just like with the uh, parking lot um, and the church, like the church kitchen. Why aren't there like uh, hundreds of little entrepreneurial businesses in church in church kitchens? It's a great open space. Um, and we have these this history of these great kitchens and meals, but, you know, six days out of the week for most of the time, it's never used. So just trying to think all the things in our building that we can use for other community groups to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you describe your ministry context in Minneapolis as a city neighborhood. And so it's a, a relatively dense um, urban setting where there's a mix of residential and retail and um, it's probably something like the neighborhood that I live in in Washington, D.C., where there's a lot of foot traffic. Um, but I'm wondering about churches that are really in deep exurbia or mm -hmm. rural churches where the lay of the land is, is really different. Um, how might some of your ideas apply to them? If you think of like the suburban and the exurban places and even the rural congregations, there's still places that people need just to come and congregate. Uh, people still need places to hear some music. Uh, people need, you know, places to meet. So churches can provide that easily. Um, you know, when we were in, we were, we did a, I had a Lily Grant for a few years ago and my wife and kids and I were, did a lot of walking and we would be in these rural spots in Scotland. And the church was this wonderful little places of hospitality along the pilgrimage trail. The, the doors were open. You could go in and just get some, they had a, they had like a little tea kitchen set up that anybody could just walk in, get a cup of tea, uh, sign the guest book. Um, sometimes there would be people playing the organ or the piano. Uh, I think that churches can be way stations like that again, uh, throughout wherever we are, uh, providing space and just a, a place maybe for some quiet and meditation. And I think we don't, we, we, we don't think of our buildings also uh, as the wonderful jewels that they really are. Uh, with modern architecture, it's really hard to find a place with the kind of um, grandeur and just vis uh, physical air that a mm -hmm. congregation and churches provide. Just a place to sit down, relax, uh, catch your breath, think about life for maybe five minutes. There doesn't have to be a church service. There doesn't have to be anybody there. Just a place to provide people. So I think in rural settings, in the exurbs and the suburbs, these are still you know very um, needed places uh, in mm -hmm. our lives. So is your church building open? I mean, is it, is it, is it open during the days? Uh, kind of, kind of. How about that? Uh, you know, we had a <laughs> and we did have a guy come in with a gun, you know, a few years ago. So that really kind of made us, you know, a little bit more, um, but, but like right now, so there's a Somali artist uh, here in town that once that was looking for a space to build a healing hut um, and couldn't find one. So we provide, we said, well, you can build it in our sanctuary. So in the back of our sanctuary right now, she's building this hut as we speak. And um, we're going to we're going to have open times for the people, for the community just to come by and see how she's working. And she said on Fridays, I'm going to provide Somali tea and treats for people that just want to stop by and, and check it out. So is it open 24 seven? No, but uh, there, we do have times where we try to open it up and make sure that people can just stop by. And, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. 
So um, this alternate vision that you're presenting um, of, of connecting to the community, I mean, in your book, you're really uh, talking about it through the lenses of evangelism and community relationship. Um, I have a background in stewardship ministry, and I couldn't help thinking as I was reading your book about the really profound implications that this has for our stewardship, whether we're talking about environmental stewardship or stewarding the church's physical assets. You write also about staffing and so forth. So, so I just wondered if you could, you could comment um, on, on this through the lens of stewardship. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, you know, Richard Foster had that great book, Money, sex, and power. And those are the three things that the church should be talking about. This venture changed the way I look at stewardship, you know, far as, you know, before is always scarcity. There's not enough money and there's not enough time and there's not enough people. Uh, but, you know, when you ride your bike or you walk, or you take public transit, you're really not moving very fast. And it gives you time to think about things. And, I, okay, how can we apply a slow church approach to this, to stewardship? So we started finding, okay, if we can use our building in a variety of ways, there's more than enough money around. Uh, there, there people are looking for um, low cost or you know, below market rental space. And we started thinking about the scarcity of people. Um, well, you know what? There, the people may not be uh, in your building right now, but there are people in the community that would like to partner with you. And when you're out in the community, you start meeting people and you start realizing that there are people that are willing to partner with you. Uh, you know, example right now. So the Kingfield neighborhood is where I, where the church uh, is located. And I, I don't live in Kingfield neighborhood. I live in the Diamond Lake neighborhood, uh, but they have an open spot for their uh, board. And I said, well, I don't live there. And they said, well, you work here. So there is a place where we can have a non a leader of a nonprofit be on our board. I said, okay, on one condition, would someone from the Kingfield board come and be an at-large member at, at our church board? Oh, and wow. Uh -huh. And you don't have to vote. I just want you to listen to what we're saying. Does it make any sense? Are we even making, we're even talking the right language? Uh, and they said, okay, we'll do that. So we're going to start that this summer. So we'll see how that goes. But there again, like the people are there. It's not a scarcity. There's people everywhere. Um, it's just how to find a way for them to be with you and to partner with you for a mission in some kind of former um, capacity. Uh, and then also about the money part. Um, if you're so scarcity bound, I think your vision becomes limited and you're not seeing the real possibilities around you. But I think, you know, when you ride a bike, when you're walking in your neighborhood, when you're talking to people, you know, there's just, there is abundance around. And, you know, we really found that out, um, you know, after George Floyd was murdered, you know, we're about a mile and a half from uh, mm -hmm. George Floyd, the, the place. And because we had been in the community and working, you know, we had a lot of connections. And when we put the call out, Hey, if you want to donate in any way, shape, or form, please do so. And we just put that on our webpage and through social media. And within I think, three weeks, we had over $50,000. And we had people from eight states and two countries uh, that were sending funds in. And, but we knew, where to, we knew where to put those funds, you know, that we, we knew the right people to talk to. We knew the areas that were in the most need. Uh, and we could give reports on those really quickly you know, with, with pictures and stories and narratives. And you know, it, it wasn't that there was a scarcity of money. There was abundance. It's just a way of trying to tell the right story, be in community with the right people, and you know, just making yourself vulnerable and open. Mm. Well, that's that's a wonderful testament to the work that you were able to do in response to the George Floyd situation. I actually was going to ask about that. Um, one of my sons um, lives in the neighborhood of your church in Minneapolis, and. Um, I've seen with my own eyes um, how that neighborhood has changed um, since the George Floyd murder and, and the protests that followed. And I, I guess what I wanted to ask is, you know, how, how you see your ministry changing um, and, and how you see urban ministry in general changing um, given the changes of COVID and the other, some of the other major occurrences of the, of the last two years. Well, I mean, I think everything changed. You know, nothing feels the the same again. Um, you know, I don't, I'm sure this is this is from colleagues I've talked to around uh, the nation. You know, there are several people. There were probably 20 to 30 percent of people just said, "I'm not coming back." Yeah. And um, you know, I think maybe the, the COVID was just maybe the uh, you know the nudge that they needed. You know, this this. But then there's a, an interesting part that there's 20 30 
people percent that are interested that weren't interested mm -hmm. before. So it's a whole new nudge. So we're rethinking everything, how the language we use, uh, the partnerships that we're in, you know, how we're using our money and resources uh, and how we're just thinking long term. Uh, what is long term right now? Um, two years, it feels like uh, that seems like a 20 year plan. plan yeah. for two years. So what's what's working right now may not work in six months. So for us, it's been really just how can we be as nimble as possible? You know, how can we be open to the movements of the spirit? And how can we really just make ourselves, um, you know, I, I don't know, again, just vulnerable again. I mean, we always feel vulnerable. Um, and, you know, I go back to that uh, metaphor that Pope Francis gave us. This is, you know, this is not a mighty fortress. Uh, you know, this is a time for the field hospital um, as a church. And mm -hmm. I, I feel that's that's kind of what we're, where we need to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank thank you for that. Yeah. Um, in the opening of your book, um, you sort of started with some assumptions, and, and I want to quote one. Um, you wrote, um, you've heard it said small churches will be extinct by 2050, but I say small churches are exactly what the world needs at this time. Uh, so why do you think that's so? I think people need to be known, and I think they need their, their names known and their stories known. Um, and they need a place where they can really kind of delve into uh, life's questions and meanings and a place where they can ask some dangerous questions, uh, where they can be messy, uh, where they can be themselves. And I think small churches provide, for me, I think small churches provide the most beautiful example of that. Um, you know, we're, right now we're in a place in our, in our country where if you, if you disagree with someone, you either unfriend them or you just say goodbye. Uh, and I think small churches, if you stick with it, uh, you know, they, they give you the capacity to love the unlovable, or at least to get, you know, go beyond just getting along, you know, appreciate someone for who they are, uh, and realize that we're all on a journey. Uh, and they may not be there where you are, or you may not be where they are. But over time, uh, relationships change, and uh, hearts get broken, and a broken hearts and open heart, and, and people are people are just uh, available in different ways in small churches than in large churches. I love large churches. I grew up in one that, you know, it nurtured me and all that, but I, I really feel that I'm, I'm myself. And I think that um, other people are allowed to be themselves, maybe even more so in, in a small church atmosphere. Yeah. Well, I do think this moment is inviting people to see how small is beautiful. It seems to be coming up in my conversations with a lot of people. And I, I hope that's just not a, not a justification for the fact that so many <laughs> churches find themselves smaller yeah. than they used to yeah. be, but, but, but maybe it is God nudging us in, in the direction that, that we need to be. So, uh, yeah. so uh, I, I want to end on a, on a fun note. Uh, so uh, I read a lot of books on church leadership and congregational life, and I have to say that yours is the very first that included a recipe collection. <laughs> So I want to let our listeners know that they can they can find out about a hundred mile granola or church plaza pizza or Instapot pulled pork uh, if they read your book. Uh, but the question I want to ask is why? <laughs> oh, I mean, so much of church is, is based around food and so much of Jesus's ministry and in, 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 the, in the Hebrew scriptures revolves around food. But, so why don't church uh, think about all the church cookbooks, too? I was always like, why don't church leadership and theology books have recipes? In them? It seems like such an important thing to central to our faith. And yet I've, I've you know, other than, uh, you know, Robert uh, Capon, I've never seen a recipe in a theological book. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think I have either. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was, I was really intrigued by it. I, I mean, you, you know, your book is novel and personal. And I think that that, that aspect of it just kind of adds to that, that wonderful quality. Um, so again, the book is Church on the Move, a practical guide for ministry in the community. And uh, Travis, I want to thank you for uh, sharing such an interesting um, perspective on, on uh, thinking about what ministry means in place. And thank you for your work and your witness. Oh, thank you, Anne. And thank you for um, leading ideas. And it's just been a, a real uh, North Star for a lot of us. So I really appreciate the work that uh, you all do. Thank you. All righty. Thanks for joining us for Leading Ideas Talks. Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos.